from our studios in New York, Bill Moyers. Welcome to the Journal. America is in a pickle. Our friends, the Russians, with whom we were about to conduct joint military exercises, decided instead to attack some of our other friends, the Georgians, who not only aspire to democracy, but control access to lots of oil and pipelines in which American energy companies have huge investments. But when President Bush demands Russia go home and leave Georgia alone, his pal, Vladimir Putin, the modern Russian czar, gets that sardonic smile on his face. He knows that American troops are spread so thin in Iraq and Afghanistan that Uncle Sam more resembles Gulliver, tied down by too many commitments, too much hubris, and too many mistakes than he does to Superman. It's a pickle, a predicament, and it's perilous. The limits of American power have never been more vividly on display. And that's the subject of my conversation this week with Andrew J. Basevich. Here is a public thinker who's been able to find an audience across the political spectrum, from the nation and the American conservative to college classes and testimony before Congress. Fixing our problems should take precedence over fixing the world's problems. Basevich speaks truth to power, no matter who is in power, which may be why those of both the left and right listen to him. Perhaps it's also because when he challenges American myths and illusions, he does so from a patriotism forged in the fire of experience as a soldier in Vietnam. After 23 years in the Army, the West Point graduate retired as a colonel and has been teaching international relations and history at Boston University. Andrew Basevich has published several acclaimed books, including this one, The New American Militarism. His latest is The Limits of Power, The End of American Exceptionalism. He's with me now. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a long time since I've read a book in which I highlighted practically every third sentence. So it took me a while to read what is in fact a rather short book. You begin with a, a quote from the Bible, the book of Second Kings chapter 20 verse 1. Set thine house in order. How come that admonition? Well, I've been troubled by the course of U.S. foreign policy for a, a long, long time. And uh, I wrote the book uh, in order to sort out my own thinking about uh, where our basic problems lay. And I really reached the conclusion that our biggest problems are within. I think there's a tendency on the part of policymakers and, and, and probably a tendency on the part of many Americans to think that the problems we face are problems that are out there somewhere beyond our borders and that if we can fix those problems then we'll be able to continue the American way of life uh, as it has long existed I think it's fundamentally wrong our major problems at are at home so this is a version of physician heal thyself well uh, yes physician heal thyself and you begin healing yourself by looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing yourself as you really are here is one of those neon sentences quote the pursuit of freedom as defined in an age of consumerism has induced a condition of dependence on imported goods on imported oil and on credit the chief desire of the american people you write is that nothing should disrupt their access to these goods that oil and that credit the chief aim of the u.s government is to satisfy that desire which it does in part through the distribution of largesse here at home and in part through the pursuit of imperial ambitions abroad. In other words, you're saying that our foreign policy is the result of a dependence on consumer goods and credit. Our foreign policy is not something simply concocted by people in Washington, D.C. and imposed on us. Our foreign policy is something that is concocted in Washington, D.C., but it reflects the perceptions of our political elite about what we want, we the people want. And what we want, by and large, I mean, one could point to many individual exceptions, but what we want, by and large, is we want this continuing flow of very cheap consumer goods. We want to be able to pump gas into our cars, regardless of how big they may happen to be, in order to be able to drive wherever we want to be able to drive. And we want to be able to do these things without having to think about whether or not the books balance at the end of the month or the end of the fiscal year. And therefore, we want this unending line of credit. 
you, you intrigued me when you wrote that the fundamental problem facing the country will remain stubbornly in place no matter who is elected in November. What's the fundamental problem you say is not going away no matter whether it's McCain or Obama? What neither of these candidates will be able to, I think, accomplish is to persuade us to look ourselves into, in the mirror, to see the direction uh, in which we are headed. And from my point of view, it's a direction towards ever greater debt and dependency. And you write that what will not go away is a yawning disparity between what Americans expect and what they are willing or able to pay. Well, Explore that a little bit. Well, I, th I think one of the ways we avoid confronting our refusal to balance the books is to rely increasingly on the projection of American military power around the world to try to maintain this dysfunctional system or set of arrangements that, that have evolved over the last 30 or 40 years. But it's not the American people who are deploying around the world. It is a very specific subset of our people, this professional army. We like to call it an all-volunteer force, right. but the truth is it's a professional army. And when we think about where we send that army, it's really an imperial army. I mean, if, if as Americans we could simply step back a little bit and contemplate the significance of the fact that Americans today are fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan and ask ourselves, how did it come to be that organizing places like Iraq and Afghanistan should have come to seem to be critical to the well-being of the United States of America. There was a time, 70, 80, 100 years ago, that we Americans sat here in the Western Hemisphere and puzzled over why British imperialists went to places like Iraq and Afghanistan. We viewed that sort of imperial adventurism with disdain, but it's really become part of what we do unless a president could ask fundamental questions about our posture in the world it becomes impossible then for any american president to engage the american people in some sort of a of a conversation about how and whether or not to change the way we live 